Question 21. In a market where three firms hold market shares of 60%, 30%, and 10%, the Herfindahl Hirschman Index, HHI, is closest to 0 0.46, 4,600, or 10,000. So for HHI, we're going to be using whole numbers for our percentages, not decimals. If you use decimals, so if you did 0 0.6, uh, 0 0.3, and 0 0.1, then you would get answer A. But if we use whole numbers like um, we're supposed to, we're basically just doing 60 squared plus 30 squared plus 10 squared gives us 4,600. So we will go with answer B. Question 22. Which of the following statements is most likely correct regarding the weak form efficient market hypothesis? So for a weak form efficient uh, market hypothesis, we're assuming that all data um, in the past, so all price data is, re or all past data is reflected in price, um, but public information and um, private information is not. So with that in mind, let's take a look at a, uh, the answers. And we can see that in this table here. I'll just pull this in so we can visualize that. So we've got A, security prices reflect all past market data. This is correct. Um, so this is probably gonna be our answer. Let's take a look at uh, B and C though. B, security prices fully reflect all types of information. Um, so we can see this is gonna be uh, descri describing strong form market efficiency. Um, we've got past market data, public and private information. So we can cross off B. C, security prices reflect all publicly known and available information. This is describing uh, semi-strong or strong, depending on how you interpret, interpret available information. Um, so either way, it's not describing weak form, so we can uh, go with answer A. Question 23, which of the following is most likely explains why the historical base rates and convergence forecast approach is not suitable for companies in highly cyclical industries? Answer A, it requires a longer term base rate and sm smooth convergence to it, which would obscure year to year volatility. This is gonna be likely be our correct answer. And so um, parsing this out, it, Highly cyclical industries are going to be a lot more volatile year to year, and so they're likely not going to be um, have a smooth convergence to that base rate. They're going to be going up and down, up and down at a much higher rate, whereas a less cyclical industry is going to have a more smooth ride, and so it would um, it'll have a smoother convergence to the mean, whatever that mean is. Um, so this is probably going to be our answer. Let's just take a look at B and C, though, to make sure those are correct. Um, and the reason there is volatility is because it, the fluctuations in performance and profitability are much more um, correlated to the economic cycle. So when the economy is bad, um, that's going to lead to bad performance, where when the economy is good, it's going to lead to good performance, whereas non-cyclical industries will have just a smoother ride throughout that uh, cycle. So B requires a short-term base rate and rapid convergence, which would highlight year-to-year -year volatility. Um, and then C is similar, well, not exactly, but it requires a medium-term base rate and moderate convergence to it, which would neither obscure nor highlight year-to-year -year volatility. So this approach, by nature, is going to be long-term. This is giving us medium-term and short-term. So we can really go ahead and rule out on that basis, and we'll stick with our answer A. Question 24, given a company's common shares do not pay dividends, which of its securities will most likely offer the lowest expected return to investors? So we've got A, common shares, B, puttable preferred shares, or C, callable preferred shares. So common stock is pretty straightforward. Um, we're gonna be shareholders owning a piece of the company. There's no option features here. But in general, common shares are gonna, um, are what you're buying in the stock market and it, there's going to be more volatility. There's no yield on it. And so these are going to typically offer a higher expected return than any preferred shares. So we can go ahead and cross off common. So now we need to decide between puttable and callable preferred shares. Puttable preferred shares are going to be advantageous to shareholders. So it's typically going to be exercised if um, rates increase. So if I'm an investor and let's say I'm receiving a 2% interest rate on my preferred shares, 
but now the market rate for the those preferred shares is 3%. I could put these shares back to the issuer and then buy the new preferred shares at 3%. So due to this feature for the investors, um, the starting yield on the preferred shares is typically going to be lower um, to account for the price of that put option that you're also receiving. Um, so that would lead to a lower expected return. So then for C, callable preferred shares. So just to reiterate, that's, that's going to be advantageous for the shareholder. So B is probably going to be our answer. C, callable preferred shares. This is going to be advantageous to the issuer since it allows them to um, call back the shares and then reissue. So normally they would do this if interest rates fall. So if the issuer is paying a 3% interest rate and interest rates fall to 2%, they could call those shares back, reissue at 2%, and now they're paying less interest. So because of this um, option for the issuer, like the starting yield is going to be higher. Um, they're going to have to pay a premium to for owning that call option. And so shareholders are going to have a higher expected return relative to the puttable shares. So long-winded answer, but lowest expected return is going to be those puttable shares um, because the, le the yield is basically going to be lowered because uh, there's value in that put option that you're having to pay for, basically. So we go with B. Question 25. Jessica Yang opens a margin account with an initial deposit of 5000 to buy 500 shares of a bank stock at 22 um, euros per share on margin. Her broker stated that her account requires a maintenance margin of 30%. Ignoring commissions and interest, calculate the margin call price. So our margin call price formula is going to be given right here. So it's going to be price times 1 minus the initial margin um, divided by 1 minus maintenance margin. So as you can see, we are given a maintenance margin of 30%, so we'll be able to just plug that in, and we're given the price um, of $22 or 22 euros per share. We need to calculate the initial margin though, because we're not given that. So in order to do so, we basically need to um, take the initial deposit and then subtract out, subtract that from uh, the actual total number of shares that were bought. So the initial margin is going to be that $5,000 that we deposited. That's our equity. And then how much we bought. So 500 times 22, which go, leads us to um, 11,000. So our initial margin is 45%. So we're putting up about 45%. So we're putting up 45% worth of equity and we have 55% debt. So now we can plug this 4.4545 into our initial margin and then put those other numbers in in order to get our margin call price. So when we do so there, we see we get 22 times that 1 minus 0.4545 um, over 1 minus 0.3 gets us to 17.1443, um, which I think if you look at the answer on the online, I think we just... We, round, we went a little further with our decimals here, which led us to a um, smaller number. So we can confidently uh, choose C here just due to just a little difference in the rounding. Question 26. David Smith owns 100 shares of Sprint Craft Incorporated, and the firm is going to elect 10 board directors. Under statutory voting, Smith can most likely cast... So under statutory voting, the most um, we can cast is going to be the same number of votes for each candidate or issue that we're voting on. So we're going to be able to cast 100 shares per each um, board director. It just has to be an equal number of shares for each uh, board director. So if we only want to vote for three of those directors, we can vote 100 times for three of them which would be 300 total votes. So the most we could do is elect, um, is vote for all 10 100 times, which would give us 1,000 votes. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the answers. So we've got A, 1,000 votes for only one member in any desired proportion. Um, this would be, uh, we can vote for one 
we can vote for more than one member. This is saying only one member. Um, so we can go ahead and rule that out. B, a maximum of 100 votes for each board member. That sounds consistent with uh, what we talked about earlier. We get one vote per share and we can apply that to each director that we want to, or each board member that we want to. 100 votes and can spread them across candidates in any proportion. That also goes against what we mentioned earlier. We can't do any proportion. Um, we mu it must be an equal proportion for each person that we're voting for. So we will go with B, maximum 100 votes for each board member. Question 27, which of the following derivatives are least likely traded through an exchange? So we've got A, futures. Futures are generally traded through exchanges. They're usually very standardized contracts um, and are gonna be cleared through exchanges. B, options. These are also generally traded through exchanges. Like futures, they're gonna be very standardized um, in the number of shares per contract and the um, underlyings that they hold. And then C, forwards, this will be our answer. Forwards are gonna be traded over the counter and are typically gonna be more custom to what the big institutions are wanting them for, wanting to use them for, whether it's interest rate, um, interest rates or currencies or uh, other things that they can use to hedge their portfolio or get exposure they want. C. Question 28, here is a comparative analysis of three companies' price to earnings ratios. We've got company A at 2.1, company B at 3.5, and company C at 3.2. Which of these companies is most likely undervalued considering that they are all operating in the same sector? So P, price to earnings is price over earnings. And so a higher PE means that we are paying a higher price per $1 of earning. So a lower PE is gonna indicate um, a lower value that the market is assigning to that company. And so pretty easy here, we look at that and we see company A is 2.1, which is clearly the lowest number. So that'll be most likely undervalued. Um, so we can go with A, company A. Question 29, An investor buys 500 shares of a non-dividend paying stock for $152. The initial margin requirement is 30% and the maintenance margin is 20%. After one year, the investor sells the stock for 178 per share. The price at which the investor would receive a margin call is closest to. So let's pull in our margin call price formula. So we're gonna be using price times one minus the initial margin over one minus maintenance margin. So we're given price that we pay 152 this price uh, that we sold that is irrelevant. We're gonna be using the that original price. And then we've got initial margin requirement of 30% given there and maintenance margin of 20%. So we're given all of these variables, so it's really just a matter of knowing the formula and then plugging those numbers in. So we plug it in, we've got that 152 times one minus 0.3 over one minus 0.2 gives us 133. So we can go with answer A, $133. Question 30, which of the following is most likely a primary source of liquidity for a firm? So primary source of liquidity, these are gonna be um, sources where we can have funds available today um, in order to fund our operations and it's not gonna have any impact or um, on the health of our balance sheet necessarily or anything like that. So with that in mind, let's take a look at these answers. We've got A, lines of credit. This is certainly gonna be a primary source of liquidity. Line of credit can be tapped at any time for use up to whatever limit you have through the bank or other lender. Um, so this is what a lot of companies will use in order to kind of sh um, fund maybe short-term shortfalls on cash flow and whatnot. So this can probably be our answer, but let's make sure we can rule out B and C. B, liquidating assets. We certainly don't wanna to have to sell assets for liquidity, and this is gonna be a secondary source of liquidity, which will be if we're in a more desperate situation for cash. Um, but we don't wanna to have to sell these assets because if we have to sell them for short term, we're probably gonna either have to take a discount on what we sell them for, or it might take a long time if we don't, and we may need the assets for the actual operations, um, which can negatively affect our future earning power. C, negotiating debt contracts. This is also gonna be a secondary source of liquidity mainly due to the uh, 
time that it could take to actually do this. You're not going to call up your lender and have them um, change the contract that day and get the funds you need. So we'll stick with A, line of credit.